until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The Sahara Desert, over 9 million square kilometers of sand and rock, it is the hottest desert in the world. But this landscape is a recent anomaly. For 6,000 years, it was a green, wet, and populated land. This is not speculation. It is a geological and archaeological fact, proven by lake bed sediments, pollen analysis, and thousands of human artifacts. This is the story of the Green Sahara and how its death triggered the innovations that built Africa's first kingdoms. The African humid period began around 10,000 BC due to a shift in the Earth's orbit that intensified African monsoons. The Sahara became a network of lakes and rivers, dominated by the vast Lake Megachad, an inland sea ten times the size of its modern remnant. The primary evidence for the human societies of this era comes from burial sites, the most important being Gobero in Niger. The earliest culture identified at Gobero is the Kifian, dating from approximately 7,600 to 5,360 BC. These were not simple foragers. Their skeletons show evidence of robust musculature consistent with a physically demanding lifestyle. They were specialist aquatic hunters. Their toolkit included microlithic stone points, but most significantly, intricately barbed bone harpoons designed for hunting large fish like Nile perch from the Sahara's ancient lakes. Their mastery of the aquatic environment is confirmed by the Dufuna canoe, found in Nigeria and dated to 6,500 BC. At 8.4 meters long, it is the second oldest boat in the world. Its sophisticated design, with a pointed bow and stern, proves a long-established boat-building tradition existed thousands of years before the first Egyptian dynasty. These were not isolated groups. They were a connected navigating population. Around 6000 BC, a new culture and a new technology appear in the archaeological record. The Tenarian people and domesticated cattle. This represents a fundamental shift from hunting to food production. At Gobero, the burials change. Tenarian graves dated from 3480 to 1620 BC are more elaborate and symbolic. These burials are rich with data. They contain the remains of cattle, indicating their central role in the culture. The presence of grinding stones shows a diversification of diet to include wild grains. The most widespread evidence of this pastoral revolution is found etched into the rock across the entire Sahara. This rock art is not just decoration, it is a data set. It documents the introduction of domesticated cattle after 6000 BC and much later, horses after 2000 BC. The art depicts specific herding practices, social gatherings, and a rich fauna that included giraffes and hippos, confirming the green environment. This art is the largest concentration of prehistoric data of its kind in the world, a visual record of the Green Sahara's most prosperous era. After 5000 BC, the monsoon rains began to retreat. The Green Sahara started to die. This environmental crisis was the primary driver for the next major social transformation the emergence of elites. As resources became scarcer, populations concentrated and competition increased. This pressure is materialized in a new form of monumental architecture, the tumulus. The earliest monumental tombs appear at Inilulu in Niger, dated to 4700 BC. These are not individual graves, but massive structures of earth and stone requiring significant coordinated labor to construct inside, archaeologists find a select few individuals buried with evidence of large-scale cattle sacrifice. 
This is direct evidence of social stratification. Cattle were now a form of wealth, and the ability to command labor and sacrifice large numbers of cattle was a clear marker of elite status. Archaeologist Kevin MacDonald posits that this Saharan pastoral complexity was the direct precursor to sedentary African states. The tumuli builders were proto-elites, and their cattle-based power structures were a blueprint for the hierarchical societies of the later Nile Valley and the Sahelian kingdoms. The final and most critical innovation spurred by the Sahara's desiccation was the invention of cereal agriculture. In the Tilemzi Valley of Mali, archaeologists have found the earliest evidence for domesticated pearl millet, dated to approximately 2400 BC. The evidence is conclusive. Pottery sherds from this period are tempered with millet chaff, and the preserved grains show a significant increase in size compared to their wild counterparts. A key indicator of domestication, pearl millet was the perfect response to the crisis. It is highly nutritious, requires minimal water, and its grain is storable, providing a food surplus that herding alone could not guarantee. This technology spread rapidly along the southern edge of the now unlivable Sahara. The adoption of agriculture created a series of new settled societies known as the West African Neolithic. This was not a uniform culture, but a mosaic of distinct traditions founded on farming and herding. The Tichit tradition in Mauritania from 1900 BC built stone walled towns. The Gajigana culture in Nigeria from 1800 BC combined millet farming with wild rice harvesting. The Nok culture from 1500 BC produced its world famous terracotta sculptures in a fully agricultural society. The Kintampo complex in Ghana shows evidence for domesticated pearl millet and cow pea. By 1800 BC, for decades, the model was a simple southward diffusion of these technologies from the Sahara. This model is now obsolete. At Bosampra Cave in Ghana, pottery has been found dating to the 11th millennium BC, far older than Saharan pottery. This proves that the southern savanna and forest zones were centers of independent technological innovation. Africa had at least five independent centers of crop domestication. The drying of the Sahara acted as a massive catalyst, forcing migrations and spreading technologies like millet farming and pastoralism. But these innovations were adopted and adapted by populations who were already technologically advanced. The result was a network of interacting cultures that laid the groundwork for the future. The final piece of the puzzle was iron. The mastery of iron working, which appeared in West Africa shortly after this period, allowed these agricultural societies to expand into more heavily forested areas. The social hierarchies, storable food surplus, and technological dynamism, born from the Green Sahara's collapse, were the direct foundations for the great medieval empires of West Africa. Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. They built their cities and ran their trade routes across the very desert that had thousands of years earlier been a green paradise. The Sahara's death was not an end but a beginning. 